Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a pleasure for me to moderate this new webinar of the ENS School Based section. This webinar is dedicated to the on the nasal approach, and we change a little the way we organize the webinar. We will start with the basics and then move to more and more complex surgical procedure. I will share with you my screen. Tomorrow, we will have the chance first to listen to Stefan Lieber, who will discuss with us some very interesting anatomical aspects. And you will see over the coming web webinars in the coming months, Stefan coming again to show very impressive anatomical lectures. Then we will listen to the talk of Luigi Cavallo on how we do a standard pituitary surgery. Then Sebastian Frulich will explain the new trend for extended endonasal approach. Mahmoud Wesserer will discuss the anatomical relationship in cellar and paracellar regions, how variation can affect the surgical plan. Then Diego Mazatenta will discuss the role of endoscopic and endonasal transtuberculum approach to treat lesions located on supracellar region. And then Henry Schroeder will discuss the skill based reconstruction after an endoscopic transnasal approach. I'm sure this webinar will still be very attractive. And I give the floor, the floor first to Stéphane Lieber, working in Paris in uh, La Riboisière Hospital. Please, Stéphane, up to you. Happy that you join our community. Is it working now, the microphone? I, I have to stop to share my screen, and I do it now. Please, Stéphane. All right. I hope it works. The um, the audio as well. The audio, yes, but I don't see your screen. Yeah, just a moment. Screen sharing. Okay. Just a moment. Sorry about this. Hi. Hello, Henry. How do you like the Greifswald skyline? We, we, are, we are online and waiting. Stefan, who is uh, just connecting his presentation, but has some uh, technical issue, no problem. We can wait a little. Otherwise, Stefan, if uh, you have some problem, we can move to the next door. But of course, it's, it, should be, uh... it, it is it is better if you, if we start by the anatomical vision that we. Yeah, yeah, but isn't it? I hope it works now. Okay, it works. Maybe you have yeah, just to move, you have just to move to the full uh, screen mode. Yeah. So, does it work with the screen? Yes. Perfect, all right. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. So this would be a, a review of some of the anatomy. Um, obviously, I cannot cover the entire endonasal um, uh, ventrolateral or ventral um, anatomy of the skull base. So, um, I just, um, to, to organize and conceptualize this, um, the, uh, the ventral, Skull base is best organized in the sagittal and the coronal plane. And just briefly to touch on these regions, um, I prepared just some screenshots for, um, for some of the aspects I will not be covering, which is um, the transcribiform approach. Just some of the anatomy um, disconnecting the ethmoidal arteries and nerves, um, connecting with the frontal draft procedure, and then essentially turning this into a craniotomy, um, extending into the uh, anterior base. I will not be covering this. Uh, in this talk, this is uh, one of the uh, interior um, uh, planes in the in the uh, in the central plane. This um, transplant and transtuberculum approach is essentially the um, the anterior superior extension of the transphenoidal standard approach to the pituitary. Um, this I will be covering a bit later on. This is the the approach to tuberculum meningiomas or craniopharyngiomas supracellar extension. 
Um, we'll be coming back to this a bit later. This is just to give a modular overview of, um, of the topics that we'll be covering. Then essentially the, the central axis um, via the sphenoid sinus to the pituitary. This is um, known to everyone, transphenoidal, um, uh, just a sphenoidal uh, approach to, uh, via the sinus, um, also possible with a pituitary transposition and then essentially inferior connecting the, the transclavular approaches in the midline, um, which can be divided as, as the uh, transcranial approaches um, into a superior, middle, and inferior third of the clivus. Um, the superior aspect deals mainly with the, with the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve, the second middle segment extending from the floor of the pituitary or the floor of the cella to the uh, level of the foramen lacerum or the pharyngobasilar um, fascia deals with the ascending uh, six uh, Dusen's nerve and then essentially the inferior third with the hyperglossal nerve, um, some of the mixed nerves laterally. We'll come back to this later. Um, and then essentially the uh, axis to uh, C1, um, tip of C2, inferior, inferior tip of the odontoid. Also, this will not be covered in detail. Just give you um, an overview of the flow of the nasal um, cavity, a eustachian tube, torus ovarius, the rectus capitis longus, attachment pharyngeal tubercle here, the muscle layer overlying the inferior clivus, and then drilling out the um, inferior, uh, anterior inferior aspect of the um, foramen magnum tip of, CM of uh, the odontoid process and the rim of C2. So these are the modules in the sagittal plane. And I will be dealing with um, the transplanum, transtuberculum, the supercell extension, and then cellar approach and transclavate approaches in the midline. Um, and just to conceptualize also with the, the coronal plane, which is much more, more complex um, and, and the, uh, the anatomy far too complex to discuss in 15 minutes, just to show some aspects of this um, coronal plane. There's an interior, a mid and a, and a posterior aspect to this. Um, the interior aspect is, is mostly the access to, um, to the orbital apex. All of the surgery is essentially surgery around the vertebra of the um, carotid artery. We'll be coming back to this, but essentially these are all the segments of the carotid artery. There's the cervical C1 segment, the petrous segment that is extending from the carotid foramen just to the um, foramen lacerum, which is uh, defined as this fibrous part for the lingual process laterally to the end of the fibrous um, aspect on the medial side, then the cavernous portion with the ascending limb, posterior genu, anterior genu, proximal ring is the superior uh, margin of the C5 um, cavernous um, carotid. Then there's a sherry, very short uh, extra cavernous and extra dural uh, clenoidal segment. And then eventually behind the uh, distal dural ring become, uh, becomes the uh, intra dural C6 and C7 carotid. Just briefly, some of the modules that can be approached by the Ian, um, by the endonasal um, approach in the coronal plane. This is orbital apex and intraorbital pathology. Depends on uh, um, on the um, on the reach of this. Um, uh, superiorly, with uh, ad adequate exposure, can reach up to the twelve o'clock position. I'm just briefly covering this module. The pterygopalatine fossa is a is a key step in the in the. Uh, in the organization of the middle aspect of the coronal plane, because it essentially is needs to be unlocked um, for the for the um, access to um, both the pterygopalatine fossa, essentially, then the uh, infratemporal fossa, uh, access to the um, to the middle fossa and the lateral uh, recess of the sphenoid. And this can be done with uh, in, in various ways of disconnecting um, the vidian nerve which is the landmark form towards the, the lacerum uh, segment of the, uh, of the carotid that can be done as a transposition or the transaction, superior, inferior vidian approaches. Um, the key landmark in the organization of the coronal plane houses the uh, terminal segments of the maxillary artery, obviously the ganglion, maxillary nerve, infraorbital nerve, the greater descending pelotine nerve. Um, then this is the lateral extension in the medial coronal plane, the infratemporal fossa, which again is a, is a, complex, um, a complex structure, which is reached by a combined um, trans pterygoid and transmaxillary approach. This is mandibular, um, mandibular fossa here with the, with the coronoid um, process and temporal nerve eustachian tube posteriorly. That's the, uh, the, the posterior aspect of the parapharyngeal space. 
um, and maxillary artery in the branches of V3. This is, um, as I said, the, the lateral extension um, behind the video nerve, which is the, the lateral recess um, towards the, the floor of the middle fossa and anterolateral and anteromedial triangles. This will not be covered in detail, but I will be showing later on some of the um, some of the cavernous sinus and the, um, the more distal part of the medial uh, cranial fossa. Then there is um, the parapharyngeal parapharyng space with the eustachian tube, which is resected in this, in this picture, um, complex anatomy, which connects anterolaterally with the, um, with the infratemporal fossa and posteriorly with, um, with the um, lacerum foramen, jugular foramen, um, petrus, um, petrus ICA superiorly. Just some examples, this is uh, V1, V2, V3, anterolateral anteromedial triangle, the eustachian tube is um, dissected. This is C1, petrus carotid up here, and drilled um, jugular, um, jugular um, towards the, with a uh, occipital condyle towards jugular foramen and upper glossal canal. This is um, just behind uh, the foramen lacerum, which is the posterior structure in the coronal plane, which needs to be controlled and dissected in order to access these, uh, these lateral um, structures. So this is um, a mobilized um, or skeletonized um, petrus ICA, the level of the, um, of the lacerum here and video nerve here. Petrus apex has been drilled, and this is the connection with overglossal canal and then the posterior aspect of, um, of the jugular foramen. This is just an overview, and of these modules, I will just be covering a bit of the transpterygoid approach, um, a bit of the midline, of midline structures of the endoscopic perspective of the um, cavernous sinus. And if we have some time left, maybe a bit of uh, pterygopodogene fossa and the foramen lacerum, because these are the key structures that need to be controlled and mobilized in order to access the coronal plane. For the younger trainees, um, this is now a stepwise um, instruction or, or anatomic uh, review of the sagittal plane. Just briefly understanding of the nose, we have an inferior, middle, and superior terminate. This is an accessory uh, uh, ostium to the maxillary sinus. This is the sphenoid um, sinus up here. This is a sagittal perspective. And if this is um, dissected laterally, it exposes the, the, stru the structures on which the terminates um, hinge. This is the attachment, the, uh, the conscious pressed of the inferior terminate. Then you have the, um, the bulla et moidalis, the uncinate process, and the uh, anterior and posterior ethmoidal system. You have the sphenoid sinus, and the basal lamella of the uh, middle terminate essentially divides all this into an anterior and um, posterior ethmoidal system. This is now exploration of the nose uh, via the, the left nostril. So we're looking at uh, the wall of the maxillary sinus here, inferior turbinate, coana, septum, and middle turbinate. This is the, this is the um, axilla of the middle turbinate in the, in the view of, um, versus superior. This is the, um, the sphenoidal ostium, which is sitting here on the sphenoidal recess of, the, of the, this diamond-shaped aspect of the, of the rostrum. This again is the, this, um, the nasal septum. And if, when, if we transect the nasal septum, this obviously is a symmetric structure. You can see the coana, uh, Rosenmüller fossa, tuberus, tuberus in the, in, the, in the back, inferior and terminate, middle terminate, superior terminate, the diamond shaped uh, rostrum with the um, ethmoidal uh, recess. This is uh, medialization of the middle terminate, which is here, which exposes the uncinate process and the bullet moidalis. This is uh, essentially the step which you need um, to do for exposure of the ethmoidal system. Um, and laterally here, yeah, the uh, ostium of the maxillary sinus and partial um, uncinectomy and, and ethmoidectomy. This now is the exposure for a more, uh, not a standard um, pituitary exposure, but um, middle turbinectomy on the, on the left side, um, on the left nostril, the, le the right side of this um, specimen for, for a more extensive approach. And just to show some of the vasculature of the nasal cavity, this is the posterior, the, the pedicle for the, for the middle terminate. That's uh, an end branch of the, of the sphenopalatine, the, uh, the IMAX um, branch, which, which supplies the, the terminate. And in the back, you can see um, it's usually a pad, um, pedicle for, for a potential um, nasal septal flap, which has been harvested here off the septum and stored in the uh, oropharynx, which is pedicled 
Again, on, on end branches, the nasal septal arteries, um, which emerge from the spinopalatine frame, end branches from the, from the IMAX and the pterygopalatine fossa. I wanted to show this picture also because it shows nicely the connection uh, between the thin bony septum and the um, diamond-shaped rostrum. And this is, um, depending on the strategy you use, um, one of the, 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 the landmark uh, for the mucosal incision. And this connection, if you do a posterior mobilization of the septum or a septectomy or a, a binostral access in the posterior septectomy window, um, this is the, the, the place where I can disconnect the nasal, um, the nasal septum, which um, is connects here with the nasal crest of the palatine bone, um, which is the verma, which has been drilled here, superior connects with the perpendicular um, plate of the ethmoid, which connects here in this um, reliable midline structure of the, of the rostrum. And then hidden here, usually hidden under the superior uh, ethmoid, um, uh, superior turbinate, um, it will here, windowed on the other side, um, sits the, um, the sphenoidal ostium. This again is a stepwise exposure um, with the ostia here, um, peeling of the mucosa on the left side, um, stepwise exposure of this um, anatomy. You can already uh, appreciate some of the uh, key landmarks, the, the, the genu of the carotid artery here and the, um, the optal apex and the optic nerve. This is planum sphenoidale and um, the rostrum in the midline. There's, um, as you know, there's various stages of um, sphenoidal uh, pneumatization. Depending on this, um, there is um, different ways of recognizing these stable landmarks. This is a very ill pneumatized specimen. This is a very uh, large, extensively pneumatized specimen where you can see the pneumatized uh, optic strut. Um, this structure, which sits between the uh, underneath the optic nerve and the, and the genu of the, the carotid. Again, you have a lot of septations, which are usually not um, midline and, and connect somehow to the, towards the carotid. Um, these are not reliable midline structures. And uh, in this specimen, you have a very ill pneumatized uh, clival recess, but nonetheless, you can appreciate the, um, the, the genu of the, of the, um, the carotid and the, um, the optic nerve above. As I said, this is the keel of the sphenoid, which is um, in, in drilling and exposure of the sphenoid sinus is a reliable landmark. Um, which is not true for the intersphenoidal um, paramedian septations within the sinus. This is now stepwise, um, stepwise um, exposure of, of the dura, the, the periosteal dura of the uh, overlying the pituitary, and that exposes uh, some of the uh, key bony um, correlates that, um, that are relevant for for paracellar approaches and, and sphenoidal surgery. Obviously, we have the, the, the genu of the carotid. We'll come back to the segments of the carotid uh, later. This is the optic nerve, falciform ligament. This is planum sphenoidale and limbus sphenoidale. This is the supracellar segment of the, of the dura. This is the intercoronary or intercavernous um, sinus. And this is the approach to the, um, to the cavernous uh, sinus and the intradural um, venous connections. Um, on this side. There is some landmarks, um, as, as we've seen, um, this is a partially pneumatized um, optic, optic strut, which correlates in endoscopy with a lateral optical carotid recess, which is this triangle, triangle between the optic and the genu of the carotid. There's an, another medial optical carotid recess, which is um, the equivalent of the distal dural ring and the, um, the, the limbus um, up here, which is not equivalent with the middle clinoid process, which sits anterior and is the landmark for the proximal dual ring. We saw this later when we discussed some of the anatomy of the uh, pericellar um, cover, um, carotid. Just some of the landmarks um, from, the intra, from the transcranial perspective. Obviously, we have an optic canal. We have a planum sphenoidale, limbus sphenoidale. The, the lateral extension of the um, optic strut is the lateral tubercular crest. In, uh, with the uh, prechiasmatic sulcus in between. Then we have the pituitary, dorsum cellae, anterior clinoid. Um, these are the key structures. This is the fold on uh, just behind the, the limbus sphenoidale is the fold um, for the uh, also attachment of the arachnoid um, in relevant in, in supracellar approaches. There's some bony variations. I had the impression there was uh, another talk about um, anatomic uh, variation or, or detail later in this 
webinar just briefly because this is relevant for the exposure of uh, of the um, of the carotid and the lateral extension removal of the uh, of the middle clinoid. There is um, different ways um, or different uh, stages of, of connection between the anterior and the middle clinoid. This is the maximal connection with the carotoclinoidal foramen when there is fusion between the middle clinoid and the anterior clinoid. This is the opposite when there is virtually no middle clinoid process. Um, and this is the uh, stage uh, in between where you have um, the middle clinoid um, connecting um, with the overlaying bone, but not forming carotid clinoid foramen. Um, this is obviously relevant once you, once you want to expose the, the overlying bone. Um, just a couple of pictures for the supracellar um, axis. This is a mix of um, obviously a transcranial perspective and the uh, endoscopic perspective. Um, we have the, the optic nerve, there's a systemal segment, then there's a segment which is running under the, uh, the falciform ligament, which correlates um, with the segment over here. Then there's the canicular, canalicular segment, which is right in the optic canal. And then obviously the intraorbital segment, which is um, towards the, um, the orbital apex intermedially. Uh, Um, just briefly, a supracellar exposure. This is preservation of the arachnoid, which protects the, uh, the infrachiasmatic vasculature, which is, um, consists usually of, of three stable branches of the superior hypophysial artery. There's an infundibular branch, there's a recurrent branch, which runs uh, with, the op um, with the chiasma, and then there is a, a branch um, um, with, uh, with the infundibulum and the anterior pituitary. Um, these are the these are the vessels um, at risk in in, uh, in uh, surgery just underneath the chiasma, which are protected in this uh, in this stage. For example, for medial uh, tubercular meningioma, uh, which is externally located um, between the uh, arachnoid and the dura. This would be um, an approach infrachiasmatic and suprachiasmatic, um, for example, for, for craniopharyngioma, so supracellar extension of, of adenomas. We have the stalk, we have the chiasma, we have the cecum communicating segment of the, um, of the carotid um, branches of the superior hypophysial, as I just said, um, connecting and supplying initially the, um, the chiasma and the um, ACOM complex just over the, overlying this. This is stepwise exposure of the pituitary and the dual relationships in between. Je ne suis pas sûr que je vais pouvoir le faire parce que je suis à la bourre. J'ai un, une réunion à quelle heure est-il? J'ai une réunion à 18 heures. Some of the supercellular, supercellular vasculature of the superior vessel and, and, and the pituitary stalk. And this is the um, this is the, the the anatomy of the of the distal and the endoscopic anatomy of the distal and proximal dual ring. This is the aspect of the middle clinoid. Um, and here you can see very clearly that this is uh, in, uh, a difference between the, the attachment of the middle clinoid process, um, which is the landmark um, for, the, for the proximal dual ring and the medial optical carotid recess, which is um, the, the medial aspect of the distal dual ring, um, which, is, which is not the same, and laterally, obviously, the um, lateral optical carotid recess. This is the aspect of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, um, I will not start a discussion about the, the consistency of this of this plane. This is um, partially capsule, partially um, fibrous tissue, but it's the um, often incomplete um, incomplete uh, wall towards uh, towards the pituitary um, between cavernous sinus and pituitary. This is the um, clinoidal space, which is um, correlates with the um, short clinoidal segment of the ICA, which is an extra cavernous um, extra dural segment and again the attachment of the um, the middle clinoid this is the medial wall of the of the um, of the cavernous sinus from the from the from the inside and again uh, vasculature of the chiasma and the tertiary stroke just briefly touching on on the, um, this is essentially the um, the sagittal plane on the, uh, the the three segments of the transclavular approach as i said there is a, a superior third which um, correlates with the floor of the pituitary um, Fossa, uh, interpeduncular fossa, third nerve, um, PCA and, and SCA arteries um, are accommodated in this, in this space. The mid clival space usually connects from the floor of the deuterate to, um, to, the, uh, to the mid clivus. Again, uh, floor of the rostrum or level of the, um, of the foramen lestrum, pharyngeal basilar um, junction. 
or the, or the pons, which is uh, um, pond to middle junction here with the ascending sixth nerve. Um, and inferiorly, you see 12 traveling interiorly towards the condyle mixed nerve in the back um, and ICA, ICA branches of the vertebral artery um, in, the, in the view uh, inferiorly in the midline. Just a bit of detail for the, uh, for the mid, for the mid clivus. As I said, this is the ascending limb of the cavernous, um, cavernous ICA. This is the pituitary of the genu here and the, the other one here. This is the floor of the, of the cellar. This is the drilled clavo uh, recess um, and already exposed the, the basilar, um, the, the dura overlying the, the basilar plexus. Um, this is the level of the foramen lacerum. And this is the uh, ascending six nerves and pecuniary granulations here, inferior hypophyseal branch of the cavernous um, ICA and Gruber's ligament, the petro sphenoidal ligament, which forms part of the roof of the, um, of the radius canal in the back of the, um, on the back of the, of the clavus. This is um, the systolic segment of six running here in the Rallus canal. This is Petrus apex um, and, uh, and reflected or retracted um, um, ICA. And this is the course, the intradural course of six, which enters the, uh, the cabinet sinus just here behind um, the, the carotid. This is mid clavus now. Um, this is the floor of the rostrum. Again, um, Vorma has been removed. This is inferior turbinate, uh, Rosenmiller, Fossa, Torus, Tubarius, the, um, the back of the um, nasopharynx. This is uh, the first muscle layer, which is the longus capitis rectus. Um, and if this is taken down stepwise, this is again a uh, pharyngeal tubercle, the attachments of these, um, these two muscular layers uh, exposes the, the inferior clavus, anterior aspect of the foramen magnum. And then uh, we would have the connection with the odontoid process here. Um, the intradural collets, we have this uh, already as vertebral artery, the pica, ica branch here of the inferior basilar, ascending six um, mixed nerves in the back. And this is the uh, region towards the condyle. This is in uh, the, uh, the second view here is towards the hippoglossal canal um, with um, 12th nerve entering into it. Just finishing with um, some of the cavernous sinus. Um, this is a bit more lateral towards the pterygoid, transtorygoid exposure of um, towards the, the middle um, fossil floor. Um, there's various ways of organizing uh, from the endonasal perspective of organizing the, the cavernous sinus. Um, this is one way of doing it. it was a paper published by Juan Fernandez Miranda in, in Pittsburgh, where we um, based this on, on the morphology of the, of the ICA um, this is essentially um, just for, for, um, for depiction of this. This is a mid sagittal section of a, of a left, left side. This is the ascending limb, posterior genu, anterior genu, um, and then supracellar uh, intra, intradural extension of the, of the ICA. Um, and the ICA has been cut out here to uh, expose all the structures of, the, of a left cavernous sinus. Um, which is essentially the sixth ascending, as we said here in the, in, under Gruber's ligament into the Rallus canal. We have five from the back. Um, we have four entering the tent um, and three via the oculomotor triangle into the, the, the uh, roof of the cabinet sinus. This is the exposure you would have um, in, in endoscopy. Some of the nerves are hidden um, behind the anterior gin of the, um, of the terminal ICA carotid. And this is the ascending limb to posterior genu, anterior genu. And based on this morphology, there's uh, four compartments which can be described. There's the superior compartment, which is uh, essentially the roof um, of the cavernous sinus. As in transcranial surgery, the roof is formed by the oculomotor um, triangle and the, um, the posterior lateral, um, ex posterior medial extension of the um, margin is the uh, interclinoid ligament, which can also be seen here between the anterior and the uh, um, posterior clinoid. This is dorsum, uh, dorsum celli here. Um, the horizontal aspect is, is depressed just to expose the, the third nerve in the, in the roof of the cavernous sinus. And this is the view, obviously not in the cavernous sinus, but into the, um, into the posterior cisternal space um, to see um, the, the entry of three traveling here between SCA, PCA, and, and four, which enters the foramen under the, the roof of the um, cavernous sinus also. This again is uh, abducens nerve in the posterior compartment, which is just behind the ascending limb of, of the uh, cavernous um, ICA. This again is Gruber's ligament. This is the nerve. This is some of the branches, clavicle branches, inferior hypophyseal branches. 
um, of the meningococcus neutron. The inferior compartment does not really have any, any, uh, any real structures to it, except for maybe the sympathetic plexus that one see on the cavernous um, ICA and some of the V1 um, branches that travel towards the, the lateral segment. Um, but usually this is just behind um, the, ascending, the ascending limb of, of, the, of the ICA. And finally, the lateral compartment, which is, which is hidden behind the, the anterior genu, in order to, to visualize this, the um, anterior clinoidal, um, the, the clinoidal uh, rings and dual rings need to be cut, and then the genu needs to be medialized, which exposes the infralateral trunk, um, three ascending, uh, ascending uh, nerves towards the superior orbital fissure, which is uh, essentially between the optic stratia, maxillary stratia. So this is the, the space of the, max, uh, the superior inferior, um, superior um, orbital fissure, um, which is uh, a, just a, um, a free space between cavernous sinus, lateral cellular compartment, superior orbital fissure and orbital apex. Um, just a few details uh, about the microvasculature. Yeah, is... Stephanie, we have to conclude because the other yeah, this is this is to... perfect. This is three slides. I make this perfect. I make this short. Just um, the, the, um, just some some of the micro, uh, microvasculature. As I said, inferior hypophysial artery um, and lateral um, infralateral trunk encountered in the in the cavernous sinus. Um, McConnell um, perforatus, supracellar perforatus. Um, and superior hypophysial artery connecting uh, or supplying uh, chiasma, optic nerve, and fundibulum. Um, this is some anatomy of the, um, of the foramen lateral. I will skip this for now. Um, again, one of the regions that needs to be controlled for, um, for access to in the coronal plane. This was a, a brief review. I hope it was, uh, was helpful for the, for the, for the sagittal plane, the understanding of the nasal stages. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining us. Your talk was, well, was truly outstanding. Your image were wonderful and the explanations very clear. A very nice introduction for our topic. Uh, Sebastian has to leave us uh, very quickly after his talk. So please, Sebastian, up to you to discuss with us the new trends in the endoscopic uh, endonasal approach, please. <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for putting the, together first those, those webinar. It's, uh, it's very nice. We had a very nice uh, review of the anatomy from uh, Stefan. So the only thing I, I wanted to talk about, about extended endonasal approach is to take the opportunity of this webinar to, to show some of the things we are trying to do to reduce uh, the aggressiveness of the approach. Uh, I think in skull-based surgery in general, whenever we push a new technique forward, we also have to think on how to make it uh, softer for the patient to reduce the footprint of such approach. Uh, our practice is, uh, is based on uh, uh, extended and low nasal approach quite a lot because we have a big referral for chordoma patients. So I am facing quite often a uh, large tumor, uh, clival tumor such as chordoma or uh, tumor extending to the cavernous sinus such as uh, uh, chondrosarcoma. As you know, for those tumors, extended and low nasal approach has really changed the way to treat those patients. Uh, reaching the clivus with a transcranial approach is uh, extremely difficult. It's very far, very deep. But if you come from the nose, it's really straightforward. It's really in front of us. Uh, but with extended London as an approach, uh, the technique have been described to increase the size of the corridor, the volume of space to work, resecting uh, some endonasal anatomy, such as middle turbinate, nasal septum, posterior etmoid, anterior etmoid, depending on the extension of the tumor. And uh, whenever you take some normal tissue, whenever you remove the mucosa into the nose from the uh, bone, for example, you create some morbidity. 
like crusting, loss of smell, bad smell, at the level of the uh, craniocervical junction. If you remove a tumor, you remove some uh, posterior pharyngeal muscle and mucosa, you may have some velopharyngeal insufficiency. If you go even more laterally uh, next to the pterygoid muscle and you remove some normal structures, you may have also some mastication difficulties and also hearing issue if you work next to the eustachian tube. We also know that uh, the issue of CSF leakage, especially at the level of the clivus for tumor like cordoma is not solved. It's much better uh, for pituitary adenoma, obviously, and also for craniopharyngioma on tuberculum cellae meningioma than it used to be at the beginning of endoscopic and the nasal. Experienced team have lowered significantly their rate of CSF leak, even if it stay, I think, uh, between five and 10%, but at the level of the clivus, it's, uh, it's uh, much higher than this. And uh, all the team who are doing a lot of clival cordoma have similar experience when the dura is open, obviously. For tumor like this, for example, the surgical footprint of the approach, uh, you need to remove a lot of endonasal structure to expose the tumor on both condyle. Well, it has a cost for a patient, as I said. So I think we need to try to reduce the approach morbidity. Uh, for this, first, we need to try to be less aggressive respecting the endonasal anatomy as much as possible, taking advantage of the paranalsi cavities, but without creating a big working volume. That's the true meaning of the endoscope, in fact, to take advantage of what nature gave us to go deep into the sphenoid sinus and not necessarily to create a big working corridor. We also have to improve dural closure uh, we saw that CSF leak is still an issue and maybe to select better the indication. So we have tried to reduce the aggressiveness of the approach by using this technique that we have published. I use it for 10, 15 years now. Uh, I hold the suction with the endoscope on the same hand and I hold an instrument with my right hand. Doing so, I'm not using a holder. I have everything in my own hands. And the smaller is the cavity, the easiest it is, because in fact, the holder is the endonasal anatomy. The corridor is very small, so the endoscope cannot move around. My section cannot move around. It can only go straight. And uh, again, the endonasal anatomy is my holder. This is how I work with the endoscope on the section on my left hand you see that the endoscope is just between my thumb and, uh, and finger. Uh, I am just supporting it. I am not holding it. And the rest of the fingers are manipulating this rotative malleable suction. And it's absolutely key to have a rotative malleable suction. You see that I can bend the tip of uh, the suction 90 degree here which means that when I rotate here with my two fingers, I can browse a very wide, a very large volume uh, deep into the nose. So again, the less is removed into the nose, the smallest is the corridor, the easiest it is for me. If I do a classic extended with uh, removal of the septum, removal of the etmoid, uh, posterior etmoid, anterior etmoid on both sides. Then I have a big cavity. I cannot just support the endoscope. I have to grab it, to hold it, to put strength into it. And then I lose the ability to manipulate my section with my remaining fingers. This is an example of how I use it. Uh, you see that my fingers are, use, are holding the tube, uh, rotating the tube, rotating the section. Most often I am just supporting the tube of the aspiration, not more. Again, there is no space for those instruments to move anyway. The advantage is that I can really have my endoscope very close from the tip of my instruments, 
without sword conflict. And one of the main issues with endoscopic endonasal technique is when you want to be very close with the tip of your endoscope from what you are actually doing with your instruments, then you increase the, war, the sword conflict between the endoscope and the instruments. If you hold everything, then you don't have this issue of sword conflict. You also need angle endoscope. I never work with a zero degree endoscope. I always work minimum with 30 degree endoscope, sometimes 45, sometimes 70. Here it's a 70. Looking at the petrous apex, that where I have removed a chondrosarcoma, and you see that I am also using bended uh, ranger. It's almost bended 90 degrees to really go deep into the petrous apex without the need for transposition of the carotid artery or transperigoid approach in this case. You can also bend the suction more than 90 degrees to work behind the paraclival segment of the ICA and above the C2 segment. We have also uh, moved to a new step, uh, trying to uh, be even more, uh, even less aggressive and we published recently this uh, manuscript which, uh, in which we describe a technique where we keep the mucosa of the nostril, of the rostrum, sorry. Uh, we incise the mucosa of the rostrum and we consider this mucosa of the rostrum as in fact the endonasal skin. It's like when you do a transcranial approach, you open the skin, you do a frontotemporal incision, you do whatever you need to do into the head. And at the end, you close the muscle and you close the skin. And the skin is the best barrier, barrier to avoid uh, CSF leakage. We do exactly the same into the nose. The rostral mucosa is our skin. We make an incision. We drill the rostrum of the sphenoid, which gives us a lot of space to work. We get into the sphenoid sinus. We remove the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus. We remove the tumor on the clivus, on the cella, cavernous sinus eventually. We use this uh, working space given by the sphenoid sinus and uh, the tumor using uh, angle scope, angle instruments. And at the end, we put a big piece of fat into the tumor cavity and sphenoid sinus. So we cranialize the sphenoid sinus and we stitch we suture the mucosa of the rostrum. It can be stitched because the mucosa of the rostrum is very thick compared to, for example, the mucosa of the roof of the nasal cavity. So this is a cartoon to show you what we do. We make this incision here a little bit in front of the rostrum. We peel the mucosa on one side and on the other side. We drill all this volume of bone of the rostrum remove the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus, remove the tumor, put some fat, and at the end, we do a stitching. I show you a few cases. I have, I have uh, several cases. I will not show all of them. This was a patient with a cordoma with a little intradural extension, not so much. And you see that this cordoma, in fact, is a little bit below the sphenoid sinus. It's not a big tumor. It was some of our first cases. This patient had a biopsy before, and he had a nasal uh, septum perforation that you can see here. So there was no nasal septal flap available in this patient. So this is where I got the idea of just uh, making an incision of the rostral mucosa and stitching it at the end. So here is a video of it. This is uh, the scar. I will do an incision here just at the level of the rostrum, a little bit low because the tumor was below the sphenoid sinus. I peel here the mucosa from the rostrum. It's a one nostril approach. I didn't took the middle terminate away. I just push it on the side. Again, it's a chopsticks technique. I am holding the section uh, with my endoscope. <coughs> I am peeling here again the mucosa from the rostrum. I am taking advantage of this volume of bone of the rostrum as much as possible. I am running below the sphenoid sinus. The mucosa of the sphenoid sinus, in fact, was not open. It was just pushed upward. We went below the sphenoid sinus. 
Navigation is useful at the beginning to identify Vidian Canal, uh, the important structure here, because there was not so much pneumatization. I was not into the sphenoid sinus, but only into the rostrum. Uh, navigation helped me. I went down below the tumor limit at the level of the clivus, lower clivus. In Cordoma, you need to drill a lot of bone because bone is most often infiltrated. And progressively, I removed the tumor. The advantage is that Cordoma are soft, so it's not so difficult to remove once you're on the tumor. What's important is to remove and to drill all the bones that you feel is infiltrated. Uh, then this was a little hole through which the tumor was going intradurally. I use angle scope, angle instruments, angle my label suction to really go into the corners. Here it's down at the level of the lower climbers. At the end, I put a piece of fat into the hole. I put some fat into the cavities that we have made and we are going to stitch uh, this mucosa. This is one technique I use at the beginning, but I have changed it now to make it much easier. It's a little bit challenging to stitch, but not so difficult. It takes a little bit of time and patience, but uh, with uh, a little bit of training and experience, it's much easier to stitch the mucosa of the rostrum, which is about four or five centimeters deep than stitching, for example, the dura mater of the clivus, which is much deeper, three centimeters deeper, uh, and uh, much more challenging to, to, to stitch because it's really a coronal plane. So here I do running stitch, and at the end, I block the node with a little uh, titanium uh, clip. Uh, until now, I had no infection. I probably did around between 10 and 15 cases like those. I had no infection of the fat uh, until now. Uh, so this is a cartoon showing the technique, removal of the tumor, putting fat and stitching. Uh, this is a post-operative MRI. What's nice is to look at the endonasal anatomy that is exactly the same than preoperatively. This was another case, bigger case, big tumor, but the biggest is the tumor, the better it is for me because the tumor gives me some space to work. So here, same technique. We do this incision on the rostrum. You see that the mucosa is pushed forward by the tumor. Exactly the same. We drill the rostrum of the sphenoid. We get into the sphenoid sinus in this case to remove the mucosa off the sphenoid sinus. You need to remove all the mucosa because otherwise you will have a mucosil. Uh, again, uh, it's a cranialization of the sphenoid sinus. So extremely important to take it all out. There was a tiny, tiny uh, little opening of the dura. This is Petrus Apex with Petrus ICA. My label bended instruments like before. Resection is complete macroscopically here. And at the end, I have this opening. I full file the cavity with fat and I stitch the same way as before the mucosa. I think it's very nice also against CSF leak because it's probably the strongest barrier for CSF leakage. When you put a nasoceptal flap, the nasoceptal flap is not supposed to be watertight. It's just something to cover and to bring vessels uh, on uh, what you put too close, but it's not made to close the nasoceptal flap. So I think here, what I do with the mucosa is really made to close. Look at the endonasal anatomy, it looks normal. This is another case, 59 years old, six nerve palsy, similar tumor of the clivus. I skipped the video because I am a bit late, but exactly the, the same technique, uh, resection of the tumor. I go fast at the end to show the stitching. Again, a little bit painful at the beginning, but much easier than stitching the dura mater. Uh, this is post-operative MRI. Uh, endonasal anatomy is, is very, uh, very normal. Same case here, but with a larger uh, intradural extension. Uh, we did exactly the same technique. Uh, one nostril pushing the turbinate on one side, 
we never work uh, both nostrils for those cases. Just one incision here. We take the tumor progressively out. You need really to have angle endoscope to go and to look around corners, but this is the true meaning of the endoscope to go around and to look around the corner. So you need specific instruments. And at the end, fat into the cavity and stitching same than uh, before. The patient is very satisfied. The mobility of the approach is not zero, but it's extremely uh, limited. Uh, I think I am almost done. This is uh, uh, another case I did recently. Uh, you see between post and preoperative, preoperative and postoperative MRI, the only thing changed is the signal of the tumor, which is now a signal of fat. But the endonasal anatomy is exactly uh, the same. Uh, Michael, I think I will stop here. Okay. Uh, I will stop here. Okay. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Impressive. You're very welcome. Impressive to see over the months and the years all your techniques are evolving to reduce the morbidity. But you are also very skilled. And at the end, it will be very interesting that you perform a functional MRI because holding two instruments in the same hands something spe special no, and different. I don't, if I make <laughs> something, in fact, it's absolutely not difficult. And, uh, and uh, I don't say that because, uh, because I, I do it. I really think it's not. It's a technique where you should not use strengths. You just support instrument and section. This is my endoscope. And with my section, the only movement I do is this. But whenever you put strengths, then it starts to be complicated. If you grab the endoscope and you put strengths, then you cannot do that. Uh, it's, it's quite easy because uh, the anatomy is helping me. And I am just, you know, taking advantage of the small corridor that is holding the instrument for me. It's just a question of concept. Uh, but quite rapidly, I started this for pituitary. And over the years, I have been quite uh, satisfied. <coughs> it's impressive. <laughs> So have a nice uh, travel, Sebastian. I, I know that you have to leave us. Thank you to be with us. Yes, thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to leave, but I wish I could be with you guys for the discussion. Bye-bye. 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 Take care. Then we move to uh, Lausanne to listen to Mahmoud Mesera. And I'm very interested to listen to his talk on how the variations change his surgical plan, especially in uh, cellar and paracellar regions. Please, Mahmoud. OK, thank you very much, Michael. Many things have been said. Uh, I will talk about anatomical relationships uh, in cellar and paracellar regions, how variation can affect the surgical plan. Uh, when we look at the literature, we can find 20% of complication after endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, fortunately, the majority of these complications are benign, but don't forget we can also have uh, serious complications like uh, vascular injury. So when you ask yourself if the endoscopy endonasal approach is minimally invasive approach, in my opinion, the answer is clearly no. Now, how to avoid uh, this kind of complication? The key, I think, is to careful analysis the images before the surgery. You have to analyze the nasal fossa, the pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus, the posterior ethmoid cells, the septation inside the sphenoid sinus, the relationship between the tumor and the optic nerves, if there is or no cavernous sinus invasion, and the anatomy of the ACA. Uh, first of all, you have to decide from which nostril you have to, uh, to approach your lesion. Uh, if you have uh, an example of uh, septal deviation or middle turbinate hypertrophy, of sure, you have to, uh, to choose the, the, the larger uh, corridor. Uh, if also, uh, if you are uh, in front of lateration of uh, your lesion, if your lesion is lateration on the left or on the right side, personally, I prefer to put uh, the endoscope in the control lateral side because the view is better. Generally, I use a unilustral approach, 
but when I need the binocular uh, approach, I put the endoscope in the contralateral side of the lesion and my tools uh, in the homolateral side. When you deal also with the conchal uh, uh, sinus, uh, don't hesitate and you need to, to, to use navigation. It's uh, very helpful, especially when you drill from the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus to the cellar floor. Also, when you approach, uh, when you, you need to approach transpirigo uh, trans with the fossa or infratemporal fossa, it's very important to the to search if you have a lateral recess, especially uh, uh, when you, you want to reach the temporal fossa uh, from below. Uh, if there is no uh, large lateral recess, personally, I prefer transcranial approach in this kind of situation. I want to share with you some cases. This is a 50-year-old woman. She came for spontaneous CCF renoria. Uh, she had previous surgery for carry malformation and hydrocephalus. For this renoria, we did an MRI, and we can see here in the sphenoid sinus the CCF uh, leakage. And in the lateral recess, we can see here the encephalocell. And in the coronal CT uh, scan, we can see clearly the defect. So I, I did a trans <coughs> nasal approach. Why? Because I have a large lateral recess. This is the intraoperative video. It's very important to open widely your sphenoid sinus, your posterior ethmoid cells, your maxillary sinus to, to see and uh, to individualize all uh, your encephalocell. Uh, uh, I drill the pterygoid <laughs> plate. And when I remove completely my encephalocell, I can see easier my defect here. It's very important to see all your defect and the, your normal dura. And after that, I, uh, I do my reconstruction with the fascia lata, casket, uh, gasket seal technique with the bone prelevated uh, from the anterior wall of uh, the sphenoid sinus. And finally, I do a flap from uh, the middle turbinate. This is the flap from my middle turbinate, and it's enough. You can, uh, uh, the patient uh, is well, and uh, uh, there is no CCF leakage after this procedure. It's very important also to, uh, to analyze your septation inside the, your sphenoid sinus. Septation inside the, the sphenoid sinus is like fingerprint. It's unique and it's very helpful. It's like road science, especially when you deal with the microadenoma and when you uh, need also to localize your ACA. Look, this is uh, a typical case of uh, Cushing uh, disease. The microadenoma is here, just uh, lateral to the medial septum. You don't need to open widely your uh, cellar floor. You need just to open uh, in front your microadenoma, lateral to this uh, uh, medial septum, uh, until the medial wall of uh, the cavernous sinus. We know the carotid is here, the microadenoma is here, and we can do your selective microadenectomy. Another case, 57-year-old uh, man, he came for headaches and right exophthalmia, and we noted in his previous history, a cranial trauma 15 years ago. So we did the, uh, the MRI and we see in this MRI a collection inside the posterior and the anterior uh, ethmoid cells. But the, the pitfall here is to individualize your, uh, and uh, your, uh, the trajectory of the optic nerve. We see here the, uh, the, uh, the optic nerve. And when we follow this optic nerve, the optic nerve is inside your mucosal. This is the optic nerve. And if you don't worry about uh, this uh, particular anatomy, you can damage easier your, uh, your optic nerve uh, during your uh, resection. This is a video. This is the 
content of the mucosid. We have to open widely the sphenoid sinus. And we know the optic nerve is not so far from here. So it's very important to open widely. And this is the optic nerve. The optic nerve is here. So you cannot manipulate directly on the optic nerve. We put the instrument superior or inferior because we are where the optic nerve is here. Without that, we can easily have a big problem with this important structure. Another important question we have uh, to analyze if there is an invasion of the cavernous sinus. It is a typical case. We have a lesion inside the cavernous sinus. This is the normal pituitary gland, ACA here. It was hemangioma. Uh, the patient came for, uh, for uh, left sixth nerve palsy. This is the exam preoperatively. We did a transphenoidal approach. We have to open the cellular floor. Uh, we protect the, pituitary, the normal pituitary gland and uh, is here. And we have to work between the pituitary gland and the carotid artery. We, we did a piecemeal resection. It's very really important to go step by step. This is the anterior part. After that, we go medially through the medial wall of the cavernous sinus here. And uh, the last piece is posterior to the carotid artery. The carotid artery is here. And we can do a gross total resection. This is the post-operative exam. There is no palsy of the cranial nerve. So it's very important to, to see before uh, your craniotomy all the important anatomical uh, landmark in the midline, the planum, the tuberculum, the cellar, and laterally the optic nerve, the carotid artery inside the cavernous sinus, the paracrevial uh, carotid artery, and uh, the medial and the lateral optical carotid recess. It's very really important to see all this anatomical nerve without that can have a big problem uh, when you do uh, endoscopic uh, endonasal approach. When you decide to do uh, uh, extended approach, you have to do properly your extended approach. It is an example for craniopharyngioma. It's very important to open until the medial optical carotid recess to see the emergency of the optic nerve. Without that, also you can uh, damage this important structure. It's very really important to planify your surgery uh, before. Planification is very important in this uh, surgery. And uh, finally, I want to share with you this case. I created this case uh, last week. Uh, it's uh, a classic uh, microadenoma, Cushing disease. As usual, my uh, resident did uh, the approach. When I was in the OR, I asked him, uh, everything is okay? Yes, everything is okay. He, he told me this is the cellar, this is the lateral optical carotid recess, and the carotid artery. But we can see here, uh, we have a particular anatomy. The cellar is a little bit upper and just uh, uh, behind the posterior ethmoid cells. I asked my resident, did you open the posterior ethmoid cells? <laughs> he told me no. And immediately I know there is a big mistake. I want to show you. This is not the cellar, but the clivus. He opened more inferior. And uh, fortunately, he stopped just uh, in front of the dura, we can see the basilar plexus. And fortunately, there is no problem with the basilar artery. So it's very important to planify your surgery before, uh, especially when we work in the small corridor. This is the normal cellar here. Uh, after opening the ethmo itself, because you can have a big trouble uh, in this uh, kind of uh, surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. You made the gap between the normal anatomy described by Stefan and how uh, this anatomy should be applied to before operating any patient by looking at all the variations that could be uh, 
uh, put you into trouble during your, your surgery. Very interesting to make this gap. So now we move uh, to the talk of uh, Diego Mazatenta, who will, will discuss with us the role of the endoscopic and the nasal transuberculum approach to treat lesions located on the supracellular region. Please, Diego, up to you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael, and uh, all the colleagues. Can, can you stop I'm to share your screen, happy. Mahmoud, maybe? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Do you, do you hear me? Do you see me? We, we can uh, listen to you. We have not yet your PowerPoint. Okay. It's coming. Okay. Do you see? Not yet in full mode. Yes, it is. Perfect. Okay. It's work. Perfect. Good. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to join the AANS School Bus Board. Thank you for Michael and the all estimated colleagues. Um, my name and my name of all Bolognese skull based group. Thank you for the invitation. We are very proud to work together and improve the excellence of AANS School Base Board. And um, historically, the transfinoidal approach has been reserved for intracellular or intrasupracellular subject traumatic, for example, craniopharyngiomas. In the last of the 80s of the 20th centuries, there were the pioneeristic paper, wrote, for example, Weiss, to use the microsurgical technique to try to enlarge the transphenoidal approach to the supradiaphragmatic approach. In fact, uh, at the end of centuries, uh, the 20th centuries, uh, Mason uh, um, uh, wrote a paper and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the cover of the Bureau of Neurosurgery was dedicated to his paper to, because he's described the approach, the supradiaphragmatic approach with the microsurgical technique to remove the pituitary stalk HTH secreting pituitary adenomas. But the extended approach to supradiaphragmatic approach improved and became the, one of the approach for the treat a lesion located on the supradiaphragmatic space during the endoscopic area. This is the paper wrote uh, 80 years ago from my mentor, uh, Giorgio Frank. We described the best indication for this type of approach to allow uh, extracapsular technique to remove the uh, pituitary adenomas growing in the supracellular space, managing the dome of the tumor and dissect its need to vascular nervous structures such as A1, A2 complex and chiasm. Obviously, uh, the, this is a paper wrote from uh, um, Amin Kassam, and uh, which the structure we meet to uh, perform this type of approach. The corridor is a sphenoid and uh, a post ectoid uh, region, and the anatomical boundaries are the optical rotary, medial optical rotary disease, the optic, um, uh, the bone of boundaries when around the optic nerve. And uh, this is the region of tuberculum cell and the plant sphenoidines. As you can see, yeah. the, extension, the extension of yeah. uh, 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 standard cellular approach is very easy to achieve. It's enough to opening this bone, sometimes very thin bone, and uh, gain access yeah. and work above the plane designed by <clears throat> the diaphragma cell and work the, in the supracellular space. Um, this is the, um, our semi-sitting position. We use uh, traditionally <coughs> the um, RD position, not caching a supine position. The head is uh, uh, lightly tilted, and uh, you can see the two main corridors to open the transtuberculum region. Obviously, the wide anterior sphenoidotomy and the lateral displacement out of fracture without cutting or fracture the middle turbinate, it's enough to gain more space in the cellular type. The colleagues before described the different type, the precellar and the coccal type. In this case, obviously, it's need to create an adequate uh, space work and could be effective to perform the posterior septostomy. 
and also the middle turbinectomy and posterior tomodectomies. These two last steps are not mandatory. The take home message is a tailored approach. In other words, if you are in front of the cellular type, the sphenoidal sinus sometimes, always, almost always, it's enough to work to approach the transtuberculum area. This is a case, a craniopharyngioma, asymmetric with different component of the tumor, as you well recognize the chiasm and the complex a one a 2 and we decided to use the transtuberculum approach to reduce and drainage the kist after following maybe the radiotherapy. We start, as you can see in this clip, the holder is fixed by the, uh, the sorry, the endoscope is fixed by the holder. We don't use the free hands. And we start with two hands, te two hands techniques as usually, uh, for, for example, for microsurgical technique. As you can see, the manage of the kist of lesion, you can see posteriorly the chiasm and the A1A2 complex. But the take home message of this clip is uh, as you can see, we can manage also the lateral kist of the tumor, and we stop the tumor removal, just the portion, a little portion, completely fused in the carotid artery M1A1. To work uh, and to remove this type of tumor, it was enough uh, only spheroidotomy. Middle turbinate are preserved, ethmoidal box are preferred. This is the early CT scan post-stop of this case. This was the result of tumor removal, and this is the control after three years. And this is the follow-up of the patient. It was able to uh, discuss its thesis on the uh, University of Physics in biophysical model and synaptic plasticity. What does it mean? It's important also the quality of life when you perform this type of surgery uh, in craniopharyngiomas. Obviously, in the concal type, for example, in pediatric craniopharyngiomas, there is no space and there is no pneumatization of the sphenoidal sinus. So it's a need to create an adequate space, drilling out the sphenoidal sinus in concal type. As you can see, it's mandatory to use the narrow navigation. We the use the drilling. It's possible to create an adequate and sufficient space in the nasal fossa. When you're in front of the dura madre using the narrow navigation, you can open the cella and the supracellar space and the tumor removal continues as usual. This is the post-operative MRI, as you can see. It's what's not necessary to remove all the bone, but just to work with your hands technique. The intradural plane, the intradural plane, there are other structure more important, the supracellular system and the anterior uh, circular willis chiasm, optic nerve stalks, and in case of uh, very uh, large lesion, gyrus rectus and orbitofrontal, orbitofrontal gyrus. This is a case of uh, a, a young female, 34 years old, affected by menorrhea and diabetes insipidus. As you can see, the tumor was located completely in the pituitary stalk. And after tumor, after a multidisciplinary dis, uh, discussion, we decided to perform a surgery. You can see the cella turcica open, the uh, diaphragma cella open, the pituitary gland, the pituitary stalks where is located the tumor, and the stalk is enlarged by the tumor itself. This is the dura madre of tuberculum cell. You can see very well above the optic chiasm. And with your hands technique, we try to uh, perform a, a very selective uh, uh, tumor removal respecting the anatomy of pituitary stalk when it's possible. If it's possible, we try to preserve it. In other type of tumor, it's not uh, necessary, it's a not sense to try to preserve always the pituitary stalks. In this case, it was possible. You see the two hands technique, the tumor removal, and the final inspection with the preservation of an anatomical preservation of the pituitary stalk, dursum celle, sorry, dursum celle, optic pathway of the cancer. This was the 
MRI postoperatively with effect for the closure. And it was the uh, 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 issue of uh, anatomopathological spindle cell oncocytomas, uh, variant of PTT cytoma. When use the endoscopic uh, endonasal transtuberculum? Always no. It's a not question of fate. In this case, this is a great tree with, the, with using the CASAM uh, classification. We can see the very uh, normal uh, tile of a ventricle. This is the position of A1, A2 complex and the chiasm. This is the window using uh, the transtuberculum approach. And you can work using the end angle endoscope and the angle instrumentation to try to remove. And this was the results postoperatively. Same position, same lesion, but in this case, there is a very important ventricular dilatation. The A1, A2 complex are uh, located in, uh, in front of the tuberculum cell region. This is, was the chiasm. And obviously, we choose the transventricular approach and we achieve the radical removal, gross total removal. The chiasm design a plane, and uh, there is two main different uh, displaced uh, possibility created by the tumor. The tumor growing up and displaced the optic pathway, and below the optic pathway, the one H2 complex are more. A safe and more safely approaches if you choose the transtuberculum approach. Conversely, the tumor that push inferiorly the, the chiasm and displace the A1A complex require a, a, a very delicate dissection with the dominant tumor for the vascular structure. As in this case, you can see the, the optic pathway, the optic thread, and the chiasm. Conversely, the A2 uh, arteries run in the top of the tumor. Same approach, cell to cigar region, tuberculum, boundaries of the optic pathway, opening the dura madre. This is the meningiomas of tuberculum cell. You can remove the tumor as you prefer. You can use also the, um, the uh, cavitron on the uh, curette, center of the bulking of the tumor, and uh, when the two mass are removed, you can dissect the, the, um, the dome of the tumor for the neurovascular structure. As you can see, the final exploration preserved the uh, pituitary stalk preserved. This is the optic uh, nerve on the left side. And this is the technique of occlusion, but is the, uh, this is another argument in the following uh, uh, communication. This is the post-operative results with the pituitary and, and the, its salt preserved, the radical removal was achieved. And uh, in case of uh, you use the transtuberculum approach to remove the tuberculum cell meningiomas, don't, uh, um, uh, don't forget the, the, the main gold aspect of this, uh, this technique. You can mobilize the, the optic nerve after the tumor removal. And so this is very important because the mobilization of optic nerve is, uh, uh, is performed when it's not hooked by the tumor. And so you can manage the, the, the optic structure after the decompression, after the tumor removal. There is another type of tumor can be managed of the, in the, this region is the optic galayoma. We published seven years ago the preliminary report. It's important to uh, remind that the, the large part of optic uh, hypothalamic gliomas are hypothalamic gliomas of uh, astroxytoma pileocyticus, grade one or two in the WHO uh, grade. And we use for gross total radical or biopsy in only selected cases. I show you this case. This is a, a young male. 23 years ago old, affected by a myopia. As you can see, this is the MRI post-op. You can see the optic thread, the chiasm, the pituitary stalk, the pituitary gland, the carotid M1, A1 uh, arteries. It's not easy to manage and decide this is a craniopharyngioma or glioma. So we decided to use the endoscope. During the tumor removal, now we use a new uh, technique of uh, uh, tractography of optic pathways. 
This is very useful because if you use that in information intraoperatively, as you can see, this is the suction tube navigated, and you can see where is the optic pathway previously uh, studied with the uh, study of tactography by MRI. As you can see, this is the tumor, this is the optic pathway, and you can see the chiasm completely displaced in the right side of the surgical field. When we check and uh, integrate it with the visualization, interoperative visualization, we can try to uh, perform a gross total or more larger um, tumor removal. This is, was the results of postoperatively. The uh, results was the pilocyte gastrocytoma grade one. And uh, this is, was the uh, postoperative, early postoperatively for MRI post op. Another case for tumor located in the planum tuberculum um, area. This is a, a, a old male, 74 years old, affected by anosmia from several years and recent visual loss. We performed this uh, the MRI and showed the lesion with the uh, upper intense uh, uh, material inside, probably exist lesion. As you can see very well, the, tum the, the tumor growing above the optic uh, pathway, but the topic pathway is displaced posteriorly. So we decide to use the transtuberculum approach. And also in this case, we use the tractography for the optic pathway also for during the opening the access to check all times real times where is the displace the optic pathways and opening safely the dura madre when we check the tumor was completely anterior in the open our windows we proceeded with the tumor removal this is a very quickly the uh, the tumor removal as you can see in this uh, uh, fat uh, material inside the, in the kist lesion, we start with the tumor removal. Uh, we start with the removal of the fat material, and after we dissect the um, uh, we dissect the, um, the, the, the 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 capsule of tumor for the uh, optic pathway and then chiasm. There is a, a very close relationship between the capsule, the tumor, and the optic pathway. As you can see, we work above the plane designed by the chiasm and the optic nerve. Posteriorly, there is A1, A2 complex. This is the gyrus rectus. We try to uh, dissect the tumor, the capsule, managing the uh, optic pathway. Posteriorly, A1, a2 uh, in the right side. Obviously, this is the dissection of the capsule from the gyrus rectus, and they also the manage the uh, uh, frontopolar arteries. When we arrive in front of the A1 A2 complex, it was impossible to dissect it, and we stopped the tumor removal. This is the lamina terminalis. And it's not usual to, to see this region because we work traditionally inferiorly to the, the optic pathway and the tumor push up the, uh, also the um, lamina terminalis space. And uh, I show you quickly the confirmation during the, the tumor removal. They use the, uh, also in this case, the tartography for the optic pathways and the close correspondence between the, uh, the <clears throat> navigation and the MRI trail. This is was the, the results, and the uh, diagnosis was intracranial mature teratoma. Another case, this is a, a, um, a, a young female, uh, 46 years old, uh, affected by was uh, uh, previously uh, operated two times in pediatric uh, uh, area in uh, 20, 70 years ago for uh, uh, dermoid. Um, he is affected. He was affected by a blind from the left eyes, 
Unfortunately, the tumor progressed and uh, affected the, and, uh, a visual loss in the only eyes, in the right eyes. We decided to use the transtuberculum approach. This is the chiasm, this is the uh, A1 arteries, and we choose the transtuberculum approach as usual, the enlarge of the bone, uh, double incision of, uh, uh, in the uh, cellular plane and the supracellular, we opening the dura madre, we remove the capsule of dermoid as much as possible, remove the material uh, inside the kist, and we explore the surgical field. And at the end, we perform the plastic repair. This is the is a, here is a very recent case. We are only the CT postoperatively. In conclusion, the endoscopic endonasal approach uh, or transtuberculum is a good option. It's not a question of faith, it's a, only an option. And we can use when the anatomical condition respected the, um, the, 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 the good indication. If better to use the standard transcranial approach, you can use the standard transcranial approach. Our talks uh, 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 would to uh, uh, stimulate a debate, and it's not only for the craniopharyngiomas or meningiomas, but also for the other type of tumor, large and very small, such as a tumor located in pituitary stone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, for your very interesting talk. We started with the anatomy. We discussed the interest of integrating the variation in the surgical procedure. We see very in interesting extradural uh, tumor resection. You move one step further and highlight uh, the limits to resect intradural lesions. And now it's uh, naturally that we will discuss the skull based reconstruction. And it will be done by uh, Henri Schroeder. Please, Henri. I'll give you the floor. Yeah, hello. Can you give me the screen? Diego? Oh, see, sorry. Are you okay? Sorry. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> that looks better. Thank you. Uh, dear Michael, thanks again for the invitation to this webinar series. So, my task is the endonasal skull base reconstruction. Of course, before you start with the surgery, we have to keep in mind how do we close the defect. And this is especially important in endoscopic endonasal skull base surgery because of the risk of CSF leakage. So therefore we have to look at the um, imaging before. So we always do a CT scan to have an idea about the anatomy. And then of course we do an MRI and we want to judge is the lesion, is it exodural or is it intradural? because from this uh, tumor location, it depends what type of scalpus reconstruction we should plan. So it's of utmost importance before you start with a surgery, to, you should have an idea how you want to close a defect. For example, here, if you see this chordoma with clearly intradural growth, you know you have to make a robust reconstruction, otherwise you will have problems with a continuous CSF leakage. So I just want to give you our uh, techniques for scalpis reconstruction. I don't want to review the literature. You can do it by your own. I just want to give you some examples how you can deal with CSF leakage. So when we have no CSF flow during the surgery, usually in pituitary cases, we just place gel foam in. Sometimes we use bone or a resorbable plate made from polydeoxanone. If we have a minor CSF flow, usually we put some collagen in, duragene, for example, and we reconstruct the uh, bony cellar flow with this resorbable plate. If we face a major CSF flow, we usually would use fat, fibrin glue. If it's a big defect and opening of the third ventricle, I still place lumbar drains. And then of course the nasoceptor flap, if it's available. So examples, when do we use bone? For example, this was a lady with a Cushing, typical Cushing disease. When you look at the MRI, you see there is small uh, intracellular adenoma located at the 
uh, cavernous sinus. You see the diaphragma cellae seems to be very thick. And usually in these cases, you don't see any uh, CSF flow. So what I like to do is that I remove, remove the bony cellar flow as, as one piece. And I take care that the longitudinal axis is longer than the um, vertical axis. So we open the gland to see the tumor. Usually we try to find a pseudocapsule, but frequently in these small adenomas, it's not possible. Here in the end, we have a kind of pseudocapsule where we can go around. So the tumor is removed and you see there is no CSF leakage. When we look inside, there is gland above the diaphragma or below the diaphragm, and then we place the bone back and we turn it 90 degrees. So it's wedged under the bone here and the bone here. So we have a bony reconstruction. This is not always required. Some people say also, no, we don't uh, need it. This is a lady after surgery, see post-op, the adenoma is removed. The lab is good and two years after surgery, she's a nice girl and, and got birth to a baby. Another technique which can also be used, it's also a small adenoma. I, I use the one millimeter kerosene because this takes less bone and you can cut around and then you lift the bony floor. This is of course not possible if you have larger tumors and the cellar bone is very thin, but in the small microadenomas, usually you can preserve the bone and then after tumor resection, I bring it back and then I turn it 90 degrees and it is wedged under the bone of the margin of your opening. Some people say it's not required. It's okay. CSF leakage is very unlikely because the diaphragma is, is uh, thick, but I like to reconstruct the bony floor as well. Then we frequently use a resorbable plate. When we remove the tumor, we put some gel form or duragene inside the cellar space, and then we place it in the epidural space. And we put it against the bony opening of the cellar, but outside of the dura usually. We published 30 cases and we had quite good results. For example, this was a lady with a uh, um, non-secreting tumor. See the tumor is only a little bit ele elevating the diaphragma. It's on the right side in, in the cellar space. So we open the dura. And then we try to find a good plane between the tumor and the gland. And you see here, we have a very nice Udo capsule where we can go around. So this is typical, the tumor. So this is all gland. And here you see this and there's a nice border between the normal gland and the grayish tumor. Tumor is resected. And then again, you see here, this is the pseudocapsule of the tumor and the yellow, the yellow structure with this typical vascular pattern is the anterior lobe. Tumors removed, there's no CSF leakage because the diaphragma is relatively thick. When you look inside, you see it's only gland. And then we put some gel foam inside. Some fibrin blue can be used. And then we put this resorbable plate and wedge it against the bony margin. So sometimes we not always use fibrin glue and if there is no CSF leakage, but we had it open already <clears throat> on the table. Otherwise you don't need it. You can just uh, use this um, resolved plate and you see very nicely the post-op MRI looks much better as when you have fat inside because you can really differentiate this is a normal gland and this is the fact where the, where the um, tumor was. It's another lady it was um, 70 two-year-old lady with an incidental finding, but then it was a growing lesion. And you see it has already close contact 
to the chiasm. So surgery was performed and you see the bone here is very thin. It's opened widely to the side. Then the dura is open, tumor is resected. The tumor is going through the wall of the cavernous sinus around the carotid, which was seen. And then here, which is a very thin diaphragm, it's a small tumor residual on the diaphragm, but you see it's very thin. And that's why it's always required you reconstruct it. Even if there was no CSF flow, I would reconstruct it. And here I use Duragene, fibrin glue, then again gel foam to fill this, the dead space. And then again, this resolvable plate is wedged under the bone to have an epidural location. This, I think it's very important. I had a patient with a also very thin diaphragmus cellae after resection, and I did not reconstruct much, just J form. So I did not reconstruct the bony cellar floor. And then he was sneezing shortly after extubation. Then a fountain of CSF came from the nose. So I think it's good when we have a reconstruction of the bone to prevent this. Fat is used when we have um, uh, 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 major CSF leakage, or also in this case, it was a 70 year old female. She became symptomatic with a partial pituitary insufficiency. And you see, she has this tumor extending into the right cavernous sinus going around the carotid. A complete encasement of the carotid on the right side. So it's very, very useful to identify the carotid before it enters into the cellar in the clival area. You see the carotid is coming here. So I have an identification and I know where I can open the dura. First, the intracellular tumor part is removed and then the tumor part from the cavernous sinus is removed. This is a soft tumor. This is the medial wall. The cavernous sinus is opened by the tumor. Then with scissors, we make it wider to get full exposure. If it starts to bleed, you know that the tumor is removed. And you see here, this the carotid is completely free. And then it is of utmost importance that this carotid is covered. I think Giorgio Frank was the first who presented a case where he removed a cordoma and he left the carotid open. It was not covering, and it was not covered by dura. And then he had a, a delayed spontaneous rupture of the carotid after two or three months. And that's why if you have exposed the carotid and it is not covered by the dura, you have to cover it. And then I think fat is the ideal material to, to protect the carotid from um, being rupture, rupturing in the future. This was a, a patient who became symptomatic with certain of palsy. And you see here is a lesion in the posterior clinoid. It looks like a chordoma. You see the posterior clinoid is involved. We could not harvest a nasoceptive flap in this patient. The posterior clinoid is removed after you make sure that it's not making a bony circle around the carotid, as we have heard in the previous presentations. So the posterior clinoid is removed and you see the big dural defect remains. And this has to be closed. There's some, some soft tissue behind the carotid is removed. You see the basal apex here. So it's a big hole, we have no flap. So what can we do? You could take fascia later in this case, or what we did, we just put one piece of fat in the dural defect, and then we filled the clival area with another fat, put some fibrin glue, tachocele and gel foam, and then tamponades and the lumbar drain. And after two days, we had to make a revision because it was CSF leakage, but that could be easily solved with another fat and glue. He refused radiation and he is without recurrence eight years after surgery now. There's another patient with a, a dural, uh, with a clival tumor. She had a thyroid cancer in her uh, history. And you see here the destruction of the bone. It looked like a chordoma. 
but could also be, of course, another lesion. We make a surgery. Fortunately, it was not a metastasis, but it was a chordoma. But you see, it's a big dural defect. It's a lower clival area. So we put some inlay fascia later into the defect, fix it with fibrin glue. And then we put a second layer fascia later as an onlay and fix it with fibrin glue. It's, the receptor flap was not possible because the biopsy was taken and the pedicle of the flap was destroyed. And then we put some fat, fix it with fibrin glue, more fat, fibrin glue, Then one layer of surgery cell or cellulose, fibrin glue. And then the next layer is um, gel foam. This is simply placed to avoid the, the tamponades get sticking to the uh, reconstruction. And then tamponades and the lumbar drain. But of course, in these cases, a nasoceptive flap is much better. So nasoceptive flap should always be taken when you um, expect that there is a dural opening with a major CSF leakage. When the nasal flap is taken, you can tailor it to the expected uh, wide of, uh, size of your skull based defect. It's important that you leave here this area because of orthofractural mucosa. And then what we do always is that we take from the contralateral side a reverse flap. And this is used to cover the area where you took your nasoceptive flap from. And that is really a big difference in the post-op outcome of the patient. The re is much faster than when you leave the denuded septum completely without any covering. See here, this is the uh, olfactory mucosa. It is in a superior turbinate area and on the medial side of the septum, the upper side of the septum. So that's why the flap should be at least one centimeter below the skull base in this area to preserve a good olfaction. And here you see the outline of the incision. This can be very wide. You can also take the floor of the nasal cavity if you want to have a very wide flap. Usually it's enough when you take all this area from the nasal septum and the pedicle is here. Then we remove the uh, bony septum about half of the septum, and then we flip the contralateral mucosa over the denuded septum, and then we fix it with two or three stitches here. So the reverse flap is, has really changed the outcome of the patient, especially in the early post-operative phase. And you see the vascular supply of the uh, nasoceptive flap is by the dorsal nasal arteries, which are branches of the sphenopalatine artery. Sometimes you have just one, but most of the time you have at least two or three. Here's one example. You see this is a defect, what we have in the clivus. This is a dural defect. You see the brainstem here. So we place a little bit of fat inside, fibrin glue, and then over it's a nasoceptor flap. The nasoceptor flap should overlap the bony margin at least five millimeters. Better is even more, eight or one centimeter, because the flap is shrinking a little bit. That's why it should, should at least overlap five millimeters, if possible, more. And it's very important that you drill all the bony septi at the um, sphenoid sinus, so you have a plain area where the flap is sitting on. The next thing is you have to remove all of the mucosa to um, have a good healing of the flap. And what I do not understand, what some people advocate is that they put some artificial material between the flap and the bone. I think that is completely wrong because you want to have an early revascularization of the flap from vessels which are in the bone. So that's why don't put anything between the flap and the bone, just the flap, so that you have an early revascularization. And if you make a post-op MRI, usually you see a very good enhancement of the flap. Here's one example. So we take a monopolar electrode to cut along the coana, and then we go at the floor of the nose coming anteriorly 
then you have to be careful that you do not uh, perforate the, the um, cartilage, the septum in front. Otherwise you get trouble with your ENT. And then we stay one centimeter below the skull base and make the upper cut. And then we store the nasal septum flap in the pharynx, or if you want to go to the um, to the caudal part, we put it into the maxillary sinus. Here's one example: a patient with a huge cranial pharyngioma. You see, the whole third ventricle is filled with a tumor, and we had the big hole. We see into the third ventricle; it's completely open, and this is a high risk. Leak, of course, so we put fat, fibrin glue to fix it. You should take care that it's not falling into the cavity and then the nasal septum flap. So we have always used fat and flap. And the Napoli group has added the flash, the early mobilization, which also prevents that you get a CSF leakage afterwards. So another patient, this was the uh, a meningioma, and here we ju just put gel foam because the arachnoid was completely intact. So if the third ventricle is not opened, you have not such a high risk of CSF leakage, and then it's okay when you take gel foam and then the flap instead of taking fat. So with the nasal septum flap, you can decrease the post-op CSF leak under 5%. If you look to the literature, some people even state it's less, but if you are under 5%, I think it's a very good result. Then complications for endonasal surgery, I want to mention two. One is the diaphragma decision. You see this was a non-secreting adenoma and it goes far up. So we make a standard approach. And then as I usually cut, I stay under the tuberculum, far under the tuberculum because I think this is safe. But in this case, you see immediately CSF leakage occurred because obviously the diaphragma origin is much lower than expected from the pre-op MR image. So then we resect the tumor and you see a major CSF leakage. So tumor resection is continued. And here you see, this is inside the dura, this is above the diaphragma. So I cut it completely, the diaphragma from, from the dura. And then to close this glue, it was, I think, not sufficient. So we stitch a dura with the O5 suture, still a little bit rigid to tie the knots in the depths. But I think it's worse to do it because this was a really a big hole. So I thought it might be better when we place some sutures to adapt the dura to the diaphragma. But this was completely unexpected that obviously the, the diaphragma position was much lower than expected from the pre-op image. And as Sebastian said in his presentation, it's a little bit time consuming to, to bring the sutures and to tie it in the depths. But can be done. Then I put some fat in to fill the dead space and then fibrin glue. And then again, I use this resorbable plate, which I gives a good buttrest and then another fat. And this is a post-op result. And this is after three months. And now you see after one year, the fat is almost completely gone. But it's interesting when you look here at the image, we think the diaphragma is pushed up and we can cut here, it's no problem. But obviously there was a folding of the diaphragma because the origin the original position of the diaphragma was that way, and then the tumor pushed it up so that we had the duplication of the dura here, and that's why I cut 
straight through this. This is unusual, but can happen. And then I want to present my worst complication. This was a 40 year old female, which was originally a male. So he was on a high dose estrogen. He was HIV positive. And he had a loss of uh, visual acuity on the right eye. And you see a really nice small tuberculum cellular meningioma. You see the steep tuberculum. So this is an ideal case to make an endoscopic endonasal resection. So at first we drill the skull base, the tuberculum. We unroof the carotid because the tumor was located in this area. You see the right carotid here, open the dura. And then you see the tumor it has a good arachnoid plane. It was easy, dissect, easy dissection by manual dissection, not simply pulling, look around, dissect the arachnoid by manual dissection as we used it in the microsurgical transcranial approaches. Tumor is removed. Then we, we resect a little bit of the infiltrated dura. We have to be careful because here somewhere is the ophthalmic artery. With the kerosene, I remove more of the dura. And you see, this is um, the uh, view you have. You see the superior hypophyseal arteries. This is a stalk. And this is a chiasm. Everything looks good. And then usually we wanted to take a, a fat at that time. And then my assistant letter, we can try tachocele. So I place a little bit of tachocele, which also is a collagen with these thrombo components that you have some fixations and fibrin glue, and then the nasal septal flap. So this was a very easy and nice operation. And after surgery, the patient reported that his vision on the right eye became better. Yes. Then in the night, 12 hours later, he started to complain of visual loss. And we made an MRI, see the nasal septal flap, looks good, everything looks good. Of course, we make immediate revision because something must be wrong. You see, this is a, the tachel seal. We removed the tachel seal. And then you see what happened. Both superior hypophyseal arteries are thrombosed and all the vessels chiasm are thrombosed. This was very bad. And you see, this is a visual field. What he has after surgery, just one half of one eye. And you see there is the edema as a sign of ischemia. So obviously the, the tachocele led to the thrombosis. I, I talked to the companies and they said, no, it cannot be because of the tachocele because immediately if it becomes wet, this coagulation process goes on. It cannot be that after so long time, it is related to that. But I think it must be maybe the vasculature is more permeable to the, um, to the um, factors of this tachocele uh, that there is a uh, coagulation initiated. So, but my advice is I would never again in my life put any tachocele close to any vessels of the optic apparatus. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Henry, for sharing with us your tips and tricks, your experience, and also your complication. Not always easy to speak about the complications, but very interesting uh, to know what we can do and what we must avoid. And definitely those advice are truly relevant. We have the chance now that Luigi Cavallo has the opportunity to join us. It's uh, for me a way to express my thankfulness to all the speakers. I know all the efforts it represents to join us 
Mahmoud and Sébastien have to leave us because they have hotel commitments. Luigi was in the operating theater, but join us. And uh, I would like to thank you, Luigi, to come. I hope you were not too much under pressure during your surgery. So it, it's a pleasure to listen to you and to know how you do a standard pituitary procedure. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. I will just try to give some uh, a tip and tricks uh, on the standard pituitary surgery, uh, just to show the uh, standard procedure to the cell. This is the evolution we had. Uh, from the Egyptian to modern time. And uh, originally the use of the endoscope was uh, described by this French neurosurgeon, Gérard Gouillot. And uh, this is the original view. The following photocinematographic recordings were taken for the first time during a transphenoidal hypovisectomy in May, 1962. Purposes, cinematographic recordings can be taken during this phase of the operation. After the resection of the septum, one can see the rostrum of this phenoidal sinus. And this reminds one of the prow of a vessel. After the removal of the tumor tissue, the cavity of the tumor is exposed. At the bottom of the cavity, one can observe the diaphragm of the cella transmitting the pulsations of the... Okay, so you see how uh, was appearing the supracellar system at that time, but the principle was absolutely right to bring something from outside, put the endoscope uh, through the cell, just to explore the descent of the supracellar system and the cell cavity. This is what we can do today, but uh, the principle uh, was, uh, was valid already 50 years ago, you see? So Gerard Gouillot really has to be considered the true pioneer of the endoscopic and the nasal technique. But of course, at that time, the overall quality of the endoscope was uh, quite poor and we had to wait more than 30 years before we start to be able to use again the endoscope through the nose. So this is our uh, uh, trajectory. You saw already in a lot of presentation, but it's very important when uh, for the first time we enter with the endoscope through the nose to find the correct orientation. The common mistake is to enter with the endoscope with a, an oblique trajectory and instead of uh, visualizing the koana, which is the main landmark, uh, you will fall inside the uh, ethmoid and risk to enter the anterior cranial fossa. So just to give some landmark, when you enter into the nasal cavity, you have to follow the inferior turbinate which guide you to the goana, then the middle turbinate will guide you to the spinet mode recess, and along the spinet mode recess, you can find the spinoid ostrum, which is uh, uh, quite often covered by the superior turbinate. So this is a panoramic view. You see inferior turbinate guide to the goana, middle turbinate to the spinet mode recess. So first reach the goana, then angle up the endoscope along with the spinal tumor recess and then enter the spinal sinus. Of course, you can even see the cell through the spinal sinus, but before try to manipulate the instrument inside the spinal sinus, you have to enlarge the anterior sphenoidal wall, okay? In doing that, you have uh, to respect the vascularization of the posterior nasal cavity coming from the posterior nasal artery and the nasal, uh, from the nasoceptal uh, um, sphenoidal artery and uh, from the posterior nasal artery. Uh, then you enter into the sphenoidal sinus. And again, uh, uh, you have to remove all the septation inside the sphenoidal sinus, not just the septa inside the, in the midline, because the risk is to fall inside the concamerational of the spinal sinus, which uh, 
uh, you can believe that is the full uh, uh, spinal sinus cavity, but that could be just a part of, of the spinal sinus. So whenever you enter the spinal sinus, it's always good to remove all the septation inside the spinal sinus. You know the different type of variation uh, of the spinal sinus cavity. This is the panoramic view you need to have when you have to approach a pituitary tumor. So this is your target, but you have also to see the bony prominence of carotid, the planum, the optic prominence. And you have always to open as much as possible the cellar flow, especially when you have to remove a small intracellular adenoma because you absolutely need to move properly the instruments by manually uh, the instruments inside the cell. This is the gland, you know, it's a sort of a conductor of uh, endocrine uh, uh, gland. And again, you see, you follow the inferior turbinate. This is an atomic video. You will reach the coana. This is your main landmark for the nasal stage. You see the second tube. Then along the spinethmoid recess, you can reach the spinoidos, which is uh, not uh, absolutely an important landmark. What you have to recognize this is the roof of the koana, because just above the roof of the koana, you will find the floor of a spinal sinus cavity. Then you detach the nasal septum from the sphenoidal pro. In this way, you increase also the maneuverability of the instrument, complete your anterior sphenoidotomy, and then you expose it to the cell. So basic concept, Never do middle tubinectomy for pituitary surgery. Of course, there are some acromegalic patients in which you have a very large hypertrophic turbinate and you are some way obliged to remove one turbinate. But otherwise, in the vast majority of the cases, there's no need to remove the middle turbinate. You just have to lateralize. Do wide spinodotomy in the use to nostril. Three main steps. Uh, during the surgery, what we do at the beginning is to use this cottonoid, soak it with diluted adrenaline and uh, local anesthetic, just to make decongestion and protect the turbinate when we lateralize. So this is what we do. We lateralize the turbinate. We coagulate with monopolar the spinal mode recess. We detach the nasal septum from the spinal probe. We resect a limited portion of the posterior nasal septum, complete anterior spinodotomy. And when we do that, we have uh, to uh, be careful of any bleeding of the spinopalatine artery. And in case we have to coagulate with bipolar forceps, this, uh, this vessel. Monopolar is not enough. It's not good to coagulate branches of spinopalatine artery. Then we have to expose all the landmark of the posterior wall. Uh, after that, you have to open the cellar floor as, the, as uh, we do with the microsurgical transpenoidal approach. In doing that, we have to remember the extreme variability of carotid artery prominence um, around the cell. And, uh, this tortuosity of our carotid artery is particularly evident, especially in acromegalic patients. You can have uh, sometimes kissing carotid just in the middle of the cell. So always to check the position of a carotid artery, not only at the level of the cell, but also along the floor of the spinal sinus, because it's not so rare to have a prominence of the petrous portion of a carotid artery inside the spinal sinus. For this reason, it's very good and useful to use the microdoppler probe. And then you have to remove the pituitary tumor. As a general rule, we use, we always start from the bottom of the cell, then we decompress and remove the part of the tumor growing toward the cavernous sinus. And only at the end, we remove uh, the upper part of the tumor. This because if you early enter and remove this part, you will have the descent of the supracellar system, which will obliterate the cellar cavity 
and will condition the removal of the tumor inside the cavernous sinus. Not so frequently it happens, but if you have a good uh, plane and you have a not uh, soft tumor, you have uh, sometimes the chance to do this uh, sort of pseudo capsule resection. You can use the compressed gland as a plane to remove uh, the pituitary tumor uh, and block. This is uh, very effective, especially if you have a functioning uh, pituitary tumor like this acromegalic one, and you see here the normal pituitary gland. There are so many ways to remove a pituitary tumor with the endoscope. Uh, this uh, paper we made the 20 years ago, we propose uh, hemispherectomy, unilateral approach, uh, but uh, honestly, what we do today is always a bilateral approach because you need the converging action of the instrument, you need to have a proper maneuverability of the instrument. Even if you have a small pituitary adenoma, it's always good to expose widely the entire uh, cell and not just to preserve part of the skin and sinus, which is absolutely not necessary. Just a few words beside pituitary on cystic cell are lesion because they seem to be quite easy to remove, but it's not always the case. Look, for example, this large cystic lesion, you see, this was a rat kid. That was a mucoid suppression. And when you have a lesion like this, you have just to empty, you have a prolapse of the cistern. You can navigate with the endoscope all around, but the, the procedure is end. Just empty and that's all. With good uh, control, you don't need to do any particular reconstruction, but different is the situation when you have a case like this one. This seems to be very easy. This is a common arachnoid, uh, intrasupracell arachnoid cyst. But you see, when you explore uh, this cavity after opening of the dura, you see that uh, the CSF uh, doesn't stop to come. And this because uh, the cyst is communicating with the subarachnoidal space. So when you have a situation like this one, you have absolutely to close uh, properly this uh, cavity because the risk of a CSF leak is quite high. So when you have a cystic lesion inside the cell, it's always good to avoid very large bone and dural opening. First, do a, an exploration of the cavity with the endoscope. And uh, if there is a communication with the subarachnoidal space, feel completely the cavity because the risk of a CSF leak uh, of this patient is quite high. Look, for example, this other arachnoid disease seems to be quite easy. We open, you see the CSF coming out, the cistern prolapsed down. Apparently there was not a communication with the subarachnoid space. We do, we made Varsalva maneuver, no CSF uh, was coming out. So we just uh, pull some, uh, put some Fabry glue. We close even uh, quite uh, hardly the floor of the cellar uh, cavity with the dura subsidy and also with the mover copericondrium. But you know what happened? This patient had leakage, post-op CSF leak. And in fact, this was a communicating arachnoid cyst. This time, we fill the cavity completely with the fat. And then again, with the dura substitute, uh, we cover with the mucopericondrum and pack the spinach sinus cavity with fabric glue. And you see the post up with the control with the piece of fat. So very important to use fat, which is the main material we are using. We have almost abandoned also this dura substitute. Fat and uh, mucosa flap are enough to close the, the skull base defect through the nose. But anyway, if you want to put some uh, uh, dura substitute, is uh, uh, better to encase the, in the epidural space, not inside the cell. And always remember, as uh, Henry Schrader say, Fill the empty cavity, natura abhor a vacuum, natura hates dead space. So this uh, does not concern only 
the cell are cavity, but also in other uh, district, whenever you have the huge uh, empty cavity, it's always good to fill with, the, with some material. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you so much, uh, Luigi. Thank Is there you. any question from you? Think, uh, everybody's yes, 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 it's already late. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you made the conclusion, Luigi. <laughs> it was uh, very nice. <laughs> the question from you? I see from the audience uh, a question maybe for Luigi or Henri or to decide whether to do a complete hypophysectomy or partial or which part to remove. It's a question from a colleague from India. For whom? I think it's maybe in Cushing's disease. Now in Cushing's disease, we remove the adenoma if we see it. If you yeah. do not find an adenoma, then we make an exploration of the gland with vertical incisions. And then if you don't see anything there, then you should rely on the uh, petrous uh, sampling. If there is an uh, indication that on the left side or right side should be the problem, then you can make a hypophysectomy as a half. I would never take the whole um, pituitary gland out, but just take half of it. If there is a sign, is it left or right? We just had the discussion with Luigi a few hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some people say you can take both sides, but you should leave the middle part with a stalk. So leave a little bit. There is some uh, anterior low anterior gland attached to the stalk. And of course, you shouldn't leave the neurohypophilus as well. So the posterior lobe should be stay. Luigi, correct? Yeah, yeah, but um, somebody proposed this, but from an anatomical point of view, I don't like because of the cell which produce a CTH are in the uh, midline. So there's no sense if you don't find the tumor to resect the lateral part. Because but how do you know? It can also be in a lateral part. No, I mean, from an anatomical point of view, the cell which produce a CTH are in the midline. So why to go laterally? I, as you say, I follow the gradient of, of uh, a CTH on uh, uh, petrosal cell sampling, but I don't do uh, explore laterally just uh, because uh, I didn't find uh, the tumor. Maybe I was not so clear, but the, the, the principle is that is to not uh, resect uh, uh, the gland without any gradient uh, on uh, petrosal sinus sampling. Yeah, sure. Then there was a question, do you prefer the use of fibrin glue at the end or in between like sandwiches? So I, would, I don't put any fibrin glue between the bone and the flap. I put some fibrin glue between the dural edges and the fat. But I take care that no, no fibrin glue goes on the bone where the flap is placed. So the flap should be exactly in contact with the bone. And then I put the fibrin glue around. I think it's very bad. Some people even put some duragene in between the flap and the bone. I think this makes uh, no sense at all. Yeah. Absolutely. I see the last question. Bad material. Fabric glue is bad material. It's just to support the other material, but not, does not favor the healing. I completely agree, Henry. Yeah. I see the last question. How long do you keep the lumbar drain? It's for Henry, but um, I think, Luigi, you are never putting a lumbar drain. Henry, you are putting one for how long? For five days, usually. So, especially in the chordomas, for example, you have seen in the lady where we had no flap and there was a chordoma, you know, there's a high risk of CSF leakage. And there we put a lumbar drain to, to decrease uh, the pressure. So I will ask to Luigi, in which indication do you maybe place a lumbar drain? No, usually no. Usually no. Even uh, in tumor uh, growing inside the first ventricle or chordoma. We are trying not to use any more. 
And if there is a, a post-operative CSF leakage, then you place a lumbar drain or not at all? Uh, no, no. What we do if there is just a small CSF leak, we try to fill uh, the stenoid sinus with fabric glue injection. Um, we, we go with the mobile cart, endoscopic mobile cart to the, to the wall and we inject uh, some fabric glue inside the stenoid sinus. If uh, we have just a small CSF leak, otherwise we prefer to reoperate and uh, put some additional fat in the, in the, in the cavity. But um, we use it. We use it a lot in the past lumbar drainage, but uh, at the end we had leakage even with lumbar drainage. You remove the drainage uh, after five days uh, and uh, after seven, eight, nine uh, days, uh, the patient can start to leak. So for us, it's uh, very important to mobilize this, the patient as soon as possible. Usually one, two days after surgery and uh, leave them, uh, uh, let them uh, to start to work. And uh, for us, this is a more, uh, more important. Of course, there are situations where not to be dogmatic. For example, patient already irradiated, the patient in which uh, you have already made the surgery and you don't have a wide nasoceptor flap uh, or material for the reconstruction. So it's okay, you, you can uh, need it. But uh, for primary surgery, we try to avoid uh, its use. Yeah, I think also if it, if it's if you have a good nasoceptive flap which is covering everything and you have a good reconstruction, then I think uh, the lumbar drain um, should not be used. But if it is a posterior fossa, you have no nasoceptive flap, I would always place a drain because it, it can be a disaster. I know one surgeon who had done at least fifteen revisions in a cordoma case which was leaking and leaking and leaking, and we had one early case of a craniofacial joma. He presented with hydrocephalus. And we put a lumbar drain and it was good. We removed the drain and as Luigi said, it starts to leak. Then we put a ventricular drain. It was fine. Then we removed and he starts to leak again. And then finally he ended up with a shunt. We yeah. placed a shunt, which was removed after one year. So this was, although there was a nasoceptive flap and it was covering everything, he has, I think he had a high pressure and high intracranial pressure. That was the reason. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I think so. Some patients have an increase in intracranial pressure, even uh, without being symptomatic for that. But they are horrible. They produce more, more CSF uh, the, uh, than other patients. Uh, and uh, whatever you do, it's quite impossible to close that. Yeah. Regardless of the type of lesion you have removed, some patients are really horrible. Yes. yes. In, in your protocol, Luigi, you uh, mobilize very quickly the patient after the surgery, but you have also recommendation during the night, and it's also important to comment on that. I will let yes, you see. Yes, that. to leave in any sitting position, never leave a uh, supine the patient, because uh, uh, where you have the hole, there are no autoregulation mechanism of the intracranial pressure. So if you leave the patient supine, the pressure on the skull base will be higher. If you elevate the head of the patient, the pressure at that level would be reduced. You can try to do this even during surgery when you do an extended approach and you put fat inside the defect. If you elevate the head of the patient, you will see the fat that will be moved more intracranially than outside. If you put the head of the patient down, you will see the fat that will be pushed out. This is a simple way to demonstrate why you never have to leave the patient supine in the bed after uh, this kind of approach. Yeah, I completely agree. At least 30 degrees up. I have yeah. one more question. Please, in regards Stephen, to Stephen, please. Just in regards to closure in, uh, for, for, for example, clavicodoma in redo cases or delayed um, flap failure after proton therapy, whatever. What's your strategy? Would you use a free flap or would you do some more complex temporoparietal options or, or artificial materials? What do you use? If it is so radiated? If it is radiated? Yeah, and just if, if there's no flap available just for redo operation or for a delayed failure after radiation or infection or whatever. 
and you need to close, would you do a free flap, a fascia lata flap, or artificial material, or a temporal parietal via the ATF? Temporal, temporal polar flap. Yeah. You need a vascular pedicle flap. Exactly. No so that's way. No way. Or you you talk to your yeah we have uh, craniofacial surgeons they are very very familiar with uh, vascularized flaps they can pay, make a vascularized flap but you need something which is living if you put that material in an irradiated area it will not work. Yeah. After seventy gray after prothotherapy. There is no vital tissue to try to fix. It's a need, a new vascular pedicle flap. Yep. Only way. Yes. There's one more question here. Do you use Dura gene by closing such a defect of the Dura? So we use Dura gene only if there's a small defect, mainly to augment the diaphragma. So what I showed it was a pituitary tumor and the diaphragma was very thin. It was just only a layer of arachnoids. And I used Dura gene to augment it because I had this case which sneezed after the extubation and then pff, a fountain of CSF came from the nose. That's why I reconstruct, uh, uh, I augment the Dura and then I reconstruct the bony floor with this resorbable plate. So we are gently arriving, I think, to the end of the webinar. It was uh, very interesting and attractive. Thank you to, to all of you, as usual. <laughs> uh, it's uh, an opportunity to invite all of you to the next uh, ENS school based section webinar, which we take place uh, mid December, 15 December. And now we will move and uh, in the next webinar, maybe more discuss other approaches. And the topic on mid-December will focus on the Teonal approach. So you will see different angle of vision to reach uh, many pathologies. And uh, I hope to start with an anatomical overview with uh, Stefan and, uh, and then move uh, as, uh, with the same format than, uh, than today. Very interesting to have from uh, the basic to the clinical applications. The how I do it technique and, uh, and the other ones. So thank you to all of you. It will be a great pleasure to meet you next time. And we, we keep in touch in the meantime or whatever. Yeah, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, See you. Bye-bye.